Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you in the Word of God this morning. I would invite you to open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, as we begin a new sermon series, The Temptations of Jesus. And I'll get to that message in a moment, but before we move forward, we want to look back for just a second. So far this year, we have been in a sermon series, Bless the World. We talked about what it looks like for us to bless our neighbors, to share the, the goodness and the grace and the love of Jesus with the people who are around us. We went through this simple acronym, uh, B-L-E-S-S, begin in prayer, listen, eat, serve, and story. Share your story. Talk about what Jesus has done for you. And one of the ways we've begun to implement that is we've uh, started to uh, join together in this real simple process, use this handy um, technological gift that has been given to us to pray for our neighbors, pray for the people on our street, pray for the people in our neighborhood. It is called... Uh, Bless Every Home. Uh, it is something that you can access on your computer, access on your phone. If you have not yet joined in this process with you, we would invite you today to begin doing this. It's a real quick and easy way. I do it every single morning. Pray for five of my neighbors. You can go to the website, Bless Every Home. You can scan this QR code. You can go to uh, the app store on your phone. Get this app on your phone. And every single morning, just join in, lock arms with people in our church who are praying for our city, praying for the people who live around us. So far, 160 of you have joined uh, at Pioneer. We have adopted just shy of 5,000 homes and so far have offered up 7,500 prayers for our neighbors. I'm joining with churches all across Abilene. Uh, so far, we've adopted over 10,000 homes in Abilene and offered up 33,000 prayers for our neighbors. That's something I can't do by myself. That's something you can't do by yourself, but all of us together Taking small, simple acts of service can bless the people who are near us and around us. Uh, I hope you will go ahead today, uh, participate in this today, start this process today as we move towards Easter. Praying for our city, praying for our people, blessing every home around us. You are all familiar with Michael Phelps. You know his story. At the age of 19, he showed up at the Olympic Games in Athens in 2004 and won eight Olympic medals. Six of them were gold. 2008, four years later, he went to Beijing. Another eight medals. This time, every single one of them, a gold medal. Eight gold medals. 2012, you know, started to get old, went to London, only won six medals and only four of them. And there was, you know, at that point in time, big debate, like, is he going to do this for another four years? Is he going to come back? In 2016, came back to Rio at the age of 31, which is like ancient in the pool, and did even better than he did in London. Six more medals, five of them gold. He is the most accomplished Olympian ever, the greatest swimmer in the history of the world, one of the most dominant athletes that the world has ever seen. And you ask the question, how did this man do it? He didn't do it from the sofa. Uh, he would get in the pool and swim 13,000 meters every single day. That's over eight miles of swimming every single day. Nights, holidays, weekends, birthdays, six or seven days a week, over 50 miles of swimming a week. And that's not all. He'd lift heavy weights three times a week, yoga or Pilates or both every single day, spend hours in the cold tub getting athletic massages, Towards the end of his career, he got real big into cupping. Um, to do all this work, he had to eat 10,000 calories a day. During competition season, it was 12,000 calories a day. Four to five times what any of us eats on our best day, he's eating that every single day. Imagine how much work it is to consume 12,000 calories. Like that, that makes my mouth hurt just thinking about <laughs> eating 12,000 calories a day. Exercise, recovery, diet. You know what we call that? Discipline. That's right. Somebody down here said it. Discipline. I, I'm a words guy. I like words. I like good words. Words matter. Uh, sometimes good words get a bad rap. Discipline is one of those good words that can get a bad rap. A lot of times we hear the word discipline. The first thing that comes to our mind is a frustrated principal 
We think of a just beat red in the face, angry, yelling, screaming football coach telling somebody to take another lap. We think of disappointed parents. We think of apoplectic bosses. We think of the word discipline. A lot of the times we equate that with punishment, with negative consequences. But, but discipline primarily is not about punishment. Discipline is about preparation. Discipline is a good word. And when we talk about good discipline, we're talking about Michael Phelps-like discipline. And over the next couple of weeks, as we head to Easter, we're going to look at this time that Jesus spends out in the wilderness where he goes intentionally on purpose to prepare himself for ministry and face temptation to deal with the devil. But before we get to the temptation, we're, this morning we're going to look at what Jesus is doing in those 40 days of preparation. What is Jesus doing in his heart, in his mind, in his body, preparing for what is to come? So where you are, as you are able, I would invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they ended, he was hungry. Let us pray. King Jesus, this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your life, for your ministry, the things you did, for what you've taught us, for what you accomplished on the cross. Lord, this morning we thank you for your preparation, the way you prepared to do all that you did in your body in this life. Lord, this morning as we read this text, as we study this story, we ask that you would be at work in here. We ask that you would be at work even now, teaching minds. King Jesus, this morning, we ask even now that you would be at work touching hearts. Even now, King Jesus, we ask that you would be transforming lives for all eternity. We thank you. We love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Before Jesus gives a single sermon, before he teaches any parables, before he performs any miracles, Before he calls any disciples, before Jesus begins his ministry, he goes out into the wilderness for 40 days of preparation. Traditionally, in the uh, church, we have modeled this, we have mirrored this, we have practiced this. Um, Traditionally, the 40 days going into Easter, Christians have taken this as a time to practice spiritual preparation, to practice spiritual discipline. And most of the time, throughout the church calendar, throughout church history, they would call that the season of Lent. Uh, Now, we're good Baptists, so we don't take Lent too seriously, uh, certainly not too legalistically. We're already well inside those 40 days, uh, that window of time. But over the next couple of weeks, we are going to model this practice as well. As we gather on Sunday mornings, we're going to look at what Jesus is doing in this season, preparing for ministry. And we are going to prepare our lives, prepare our minds, prepare our hearts to celebrate Easter. We're going to practice this type of preparation. Just as Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days, we're going to spend a season in spiritual preparation. And I love this text. We get to the end of verse 2. We have these words. Sometimes you're just reading stuff in the Bible. It just makes you laugh, makes you smile, makes you wake up, right? It says, he was hungry. Pastors read that and start to lick their lips, right? He was hungry. That seems kind of obvious. He's been in the wilderness. He has not been eating. There has been nothing for 40 days. Thank you for the narration, biblical author. He was hungry. But that's the point of the story. And it's a big point in our story. It's a big point of who we are and what it means to be human. We are hungry. You are hungry. I am hungry. We, we are a hungry people. We have strong appetites, desires, deep longings and yearnings, things in us that need to be filled. And the truth is, if they're filled today, we will feel them tomorrow. This is part of what it means to be human. And Jesus 
chooses this. Jesus chooses to be hungry. He's the God of the universe. He doesn't need anything. He does not need food. He certainly doesn't need bread. And yet, he decides, I am going to leave heaven and come to earth. Philippians 2 tells us that he humbles himself, takes on the very nature of a servant, puts on flesh. And Jesus makes this decision, I am going to be hungry. I'm going to know the pain of this world. I'm going to know the hurt of this world. I'm going to know the struggle and the sin and the sickness and the suffering of this world. We do not serve a God who is distant from us. We serve a God who chose to make himself near to us, who chose to come in the flesh, who chose to come and know what it is to be human, to make himself hungry, to be able to be hungry. And not only did he choose that existence, did he choose to come to humanity, did he choose to come in the flesh, but he chose in this situation, he chose in this instance to wander out into the wilderness and to be hungry on purpose. This is not an accident. This is not, you know, unintentional suffering. Like, oh man, I got out here and I forgot to pack a lunch. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. We're going to look next week. I mean, Jesus could fix this real quick. If Jesus wanted a snack, he could have a snack, right? We've seen this story. Jesus with the boy with the Lunchables down by the pond. Jesus could pick up rocks and start to crack them and start to break them and have more than enough to eat. This is not a situation where Jesus is impotent or powerless or unable to rectify the situation. Jesus could eat if he wanted to eat. Jesus is choosing to be hungry. Jesus chose to intentionally discipline his body. He thought it was important. He thought it was necessary. He thought it was good. Jesus knew everything that, that lie over the horizon for him. He knew everything that was to come. He knew the work that was ahead of him. And Jesus says, before I go and do, I am going to sit and prepare And now, we could talk a lot about this. We, we could talk a lot about the significance of this, the theological ramifications of this. Why does Jesus go and intentionally discipline his body? But, but one of the things that we're going to focus on today is Jesus chooses to intentionally discipline his body as a model for you and me that we might learn and follow in his path. Jesus doesn't actually have to eat, but he models eating for us, Jesus doesn't actually have to be baptized. He does not need to be baptized, but he goes and is baptized because he wants to model that for us. Jesus wanders out into the wilderness and fasts, not because he needs to, but because he wants to model this for us. This is part of what God expects us to do. This is part of who God expects us to be. God experiences spiritual preparation. God experiences fasting. And God expects that we are going to discipline ourselves. God expects that we will discipline ourselves. This is a divine calling. This is not a mere suggestion. This is not a helpful tip. This is not, oh, by the way, if you get around to it or if you find some time or as you are able, maybe this is something you would like to do after you get done with all the important things that I have for you in this life and in this world. Jesus models spiritual preparation and says, I expect you to undergo spiritual preparation. You need spiritual practice. No team ever goes and plays a game before they have practice, before they have a lot of practice. No marching band ever gets on a bus and goes to competition before they undergo a whole lot of practice. There's no Broadway star that steps onto the stage and performs a show before they practice. There's no, no singer who takes the microphone and sings a solo before they practice. If these people want to see success, practice precedes success. 
In this world, we are spiritual beings and we are fighting spiritual wars. And if we expect to see success in our spiritual battles before we get into the spiritual battle, we need spiritual practice. We need spiritual discipline. We need spiritual preparation. Before we expect to work these muscles in a successful way, we've got to build these muscles. We've got to practice these muscles. God expects us to discipline ourselves. A church body, there is nobody that can do this for you. Nobody can do your discipline for you and give it to you. Nobody can choose discipline for you. This is a choice you have to make yourself. Your parents cannot discipline you. Your spouse cannot discipline you. There is no pastor, not John, not Daniel, not Jeff, who can discipline you. If we are going to be disciplined people, if we are going to be spiritually prepared people, this involves drawing a circle around ourselves and working on everybody inside of that circle. We can be coached. We can be pastored, we can be encouraged, but even that is an intentional personal decision to humble myself, to accept that leadership and to follow it. And we have to discipline ourselves if we're going to see the spiritual growth that we hope and desire and pray for. And you'll see in this point, I want to talk about discipline, I'm not just talking about discipline our body. Certainly we need to discipline our body, but spiritual discipline is so much more than just our body. It is our mouth. It is our minds. It is our spirit. It's our soul. It's our emotions. It's our relationships. The Bible has a lot to say about self-control. It has a lot to say about discipline. I'm going to share a couple of my favorite passages this morning and maybe in your spiritual preparation this week, over the next couple of weeks, you might want to memorize some of these. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is talking to the people and he says this, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. I discipline my body and keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul starts in the same place that I did this morning. He starts with the Olympic athlete. He starts with Michael Phelps. He says, look at Michael Phelps and all he does to discipline his body. He's competing for something that perishes. One day, Michael Phelps is going to own those gold medals no more. We are competing for something far more important. We're concerned about things that are not temporary. We are concerned about eternal things. And so we discipline our bodies. And throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul has been speaking very clearly to the Corinthians that we live in embodied faith. We live in incarnational faith. Our life in the body is important and it matters. We are physical beings. We are physical people. And the way we live in our body demonstrates our faith. And he's covered the whole range of physical faith struggles here. He's got into passions and lusts of the flesh. He has talked about food. He's talked about drink. He's looked at the Corinthians and said, you are hungry. And your hungers are ruling you. Your appetites are destroying you. As people of God, as people of faith, we need to discipline our body. And if you can't do this, it will lead to your ruin. We're working towards eternity. Athletes, Olympic athletes, they're working towards something that is temporary. Olympic glory fades. The glory of our God is eternal. And these bodies we inhabit are eternal. We are eternal beings. We need to discipline our bodies. I I loved the text that Jeff read for us earlier in James chapter 3. We need to discipline our tongues. The tongue is a tiny vessel, but a small spark can lead to a raging inferno. Just a, a little bit, like literally a little bit, controls a massive war horse. A small rudder steers a titanic ship. And with our mouth, we can do immeasurable good. We can do infinite good. We can bless the Lord. We can bless our neighbor. We can bless the world with our words. 
We can use good words to do good works. And we can also use our words, we can use our tongue to do a measurable hurt. To crush with pain and sorrow, with gossip and slander and lies. James writes, we need to discipline our tongues. In 1 Peter chapter 4, he writes this verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Peter writes and says, it's important for us to discipline our minds. We need to practice self-control and be of sober mind. You get to choose what you think about. You get to choose how we think. Our brains are not victims of this world. We are not slaves to the last screen that we looked at, and we don't have to believe everything that it tells us is true, and we don't have to do everything that it's telling us to do. This is why Paul writes in Philippians, whatever is true, whatever is just, whatever is excellent, whatever is lovely, whatever is praiseworthy, think about these things. We get to choose what we think about. And what we think determines what we do, and the things that we do determine who we become. What you think about is who you become. If you think about good things, you think about holy things, you think about just and righteous things, if that is where you place your attention and your focus, that is who you will become. And if we fill our minds with the things of this world, we fill our minds with the things of the flesh, we fill our minds with our appetites, our desires, our hungers, our longings, the things that we want from this world, that is what we will focus on, that is what we will pursue, and that is who we will become. Paul ends this text with this very funny statement. Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. For the sake of your prayers. This reminds me of a story in Matthew chapter 17. Jesus has the disciples, they are gathered around, they're doing ministry, and this man brings his son to Jesus, says, Jesus, have mercy on me. My son has fits and he throws himself on the ground and he throws himself on the fire and he causes damage to himself. He hurts himself. And I brought him to your disciples and your disciples could not heal him. Jesus goes, oh, you faithless generation. And he speaks and in a moment. The boy is healed. The demon leaves him. And later the disciples come to him and they go, Jesus, why couldn't we do that? Peter's standing right there, Jesus, why couldn't we do that? And Jesus looks at him and goes, oh, ye of little faith. If you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could speak to this mountain and say move and it would throw itself. But this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. Jesus looks at the disciples and says, you can't do the work that I have called you to do in this world. Because your faith isn't strong enough. You need to go practice more prayer and fasting. You need to do a better job of preparing. And Peter writes the same thing later in life. He has learned this lesson. We need to be disciplined. We need to practice spiritual preparation in order to see the power that we want in this world. Preparation is power. Preparation precedes power. If you want to do the kingdom work that God is calling you to do in this world, if you want to leave the impact in your neighborhood, in your city, at your workplace, where you go, if you want to watch resurrection power flow through you, through your life, into the community of people who are around you, preparation is power. Preparation precedes power. We have to practice spiritual discipline before the work of God will be accomplished in our life. Jesus tells the disciples this. Peter learns this lesson. Peter tells us this. We have to discipline our mind. We have to discipline our tongue. We have to discipline our bodies. This kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. So what does that look like for you over the next month, five weeks, as we lead into Easter? What does that look like for me as we prepare our hearts, our minds to celebrate, as we prepare to move in power, to to overcome whatever obstacles life is about to send to us in this next season of life? 
God is certainly calling every single one of us to put to death things that are in the flesh. There are certainly um, fleshly desires and fleshly sins that we are walking in that God is saying, it is time to leave this in the past. It is time to put your flesh to death. And, and putting sin to death is not fasting, all right? You cannot fast for 40 days from sin. We just need to die to sin. Fasting is saying no to things that are of the flesh that we desire, that we hope, that we want, that are good. Food is good. I need everybody to hear me. Food is good. We're, we're Baptists. We believe this. Food is good. All right? Food is a gift from God. You were created to eat food. You were created to enjoy food. Can I get an amen this morning? But sometimes we forego the good gifts of God so that we can focus our mind and our heart and our attention on him so we can hear from him and learn and grow and practice growth. And in foregoing the good gift, we make ourselves dependent on God. When we are fasting, we are literally saying, God, I need your strength. I need your power. I cannot do this on my own. I don't have the strength. I don't have the power. I don't have the ability to do this without you. And throughout the Bible, we see the people of God spend a lot of time fasting, preparing, foregoing food, and making themselves dependent upon the Lord. As Americans, this is something we don't like. We don't like to think about. We don't want to go without food. I'm hungry, and I want to eat whatever I want to eat. The Bible makes it pretty clear that, that we are called to seasons and periods and times of fasting. Now, there are some of you, because of certain health uh, issues at the moment, because of certain dietary restrictions, um, probably should not be taking fasting from food seriously. And I, I don't want anybody to walk out of here today and start a 40-day fast, okay? All these things we need to prepare to prepare, right? Like we need to get some resources, talk to our doctors, make sure we understand what we're doing before we jump into this. But God is enough. God is able and God is calling most of us to fast from food for a season to spend time in spiritual reflection and spiritual growth. But beyond that, God is calling us to fast from a whole number of other good gifts as well. We are busy. Our lives are busy. Our calendars are busy. Our minds and hearts are busy. And a lot of these things, we're busy with good things. But God is saying, I am the best thing. And we need to take some time off. We need to make some sacrifices. We need to turn some things off. We need to deny certain desires for a season to focus our heart on God and say, God, who is it that you want me to be? Where is it that you want me to change? Where is it that you want me to grow? I bet for every single person in here, we could sit down and make a list of a different way that God is calling us to reorganize our calendar, to reschedule our lives, to reprioritize ourselves so we can do the things that he's calling us to do, so we can be the people that he is calling us to be. I wonder what that looks like for you this week. I wonder what that looks like for you this month. And more importantly, I wonder what kind of power awaits you on the other side of your discipline. Let's pray. King Jesus, this morning, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your word. We thank you how you have modeled for us spiritual discipline, spiritual preparation, spiritual growth. Well, this morning we come in here a grateful people, a thankful people. We thank you for the many good gifts that you have given to us, the things you continue to provide. And Lord, this morning we ask for clear direction. We ask this morning that you would show us what are the desires of the flesh that we need to put to death. What are the good gifts that we need to forego so that we might grow? God, where and how and from what would you have us fast? Lord, as we prepare for this next season, 
as we move towards Easter, we ask just that you would give us guidance and clarity, wisdom, direction. That we might be able to say no to the things we need to say no to so we could be the people that you are calling us to be. Lord, thank you. We love you. And then we pray. Amen.